Hi. <clears throat> Hi, everybody, and welcome back to video number six in chapter three. And here we're going to look at counting changes, estimates, and errors. So um, we can make retrospective adjustments. We can make cumulative effect adjustments to the beginning retained earnings. We can approach preserves, comp or the approach preserves comparability across years. And the example includes maybe a change from FIFO to average cost or a change from percentage of completion to completed contract methods. Here is that Galbert decides on March 2025 to change from FIFO to weighted average. It's income before taxes. Um, using the new weighted average method in 2025 is 30,000. Its pre tax income is as follows. So it shows the FIFO, it shows weighted average, it shows the excess of FIFO over weighted average. Assuming a tax rate of 30%, what net income should we report in 2023, 24, and 25? remembering that this wasn't done until March 2025. All right, let's take a look. Here is the solution. And in the case of income before income tax, let's go back. Here is the FIFO, right? And here's the weighted average. And here's the excess of FIFO over weighted average in 2024. So in 2023, I have 40,000. Okay. So here is 2023 income tax. Here's 2024, 27,000. Here's that 27,000. And finally, 30,000 for 2025 and the effect of the income tax. Pretty straightforward there, right? So changes in accounting estimates. They're accounted for in the period of change or period of change and future periods if the change affects both. It's not handled retrospect retrospectively, so it's not considered an error, right? So these examples include useful lives, salvage value calculations of depreciable assets, the allowance for uncollectible receivables, inventory obsolescence. We're not going to go back retrospectively here. So let's take a look. Do page materials in this example consistently estimated its bad debt expense of 1% of accounts receivable? In 2025, however, they determined they must revise that upward um, to 2% or double the prior year's percentage. The 2% is necessary to reduce accounts receivable to its net realizable value. So using 2% results in bad debt expense of a whopping $240,000 or double the amount of 120,000 using the 1% estimate per prior year. What entry would you advise them making for 2025? Okay, so the solution is they're gonna record the bad debt expense and related allowance at December 2025, assuming a zero balance in the allowance as follows. So we hit bad debt expense, debit, credit the allowance for doubtful accounts, both for 240,000, 1% or 2% as indicated in here, 2%. Okay, no prior period are adjusted in this case. All right, 
correction of errors is different. We can have mathematical mistakes, mistakes in applying accounting principles, just flat oversight or misuse of facts. Corrections tr are treated as a prior period adjustment. And I should insert here if they are material, right? The adjustment to the beginning balance of retained earnings is where we would do this prior period adjustment. So here's an example. Here's Bur Burrow determined that it incorrectly overstated it accounts receivable and sales revenue by 100,000 in 2025. It's material. So it makes the following entry to correct for this error in 2026. It's going to it's going to reduce retained earnings by 100,000 and credit accounts receivable reducing it to uh, by 100,000. You'll notice this was to sales revenue, so the effect of that would eventually hit the retained earnings on the balance. Okay, so here's a change in accounting principle, right? And it changes from one generally accepted a principle to another. That's fine. And the example was FIFO to average cost. And we're going to recast prior year's income statements on the same basis as the newly adopted principle shown net of net of tax now changes in estimates those are normal so those recurring adjustments are done on the fly if you want to look at like that they change in the realizable realizability of receivables and inventory etc etc so that's a change in estimate. We show the change only in the affected accounts in the current and future periods, not shown net of tax. Corrections of errors, a mistake, misuse of tax. Here, we're going to um, report the error as a prior period adjustment and restate prior year's income statement to correct for that error, again, shown net of tax. Now let's take a look. You're working with the external reporting department for Palmer. You've been assigned the task of evaluating the classification of various items to be reported in this year's financial statements. You're working through the following list. The company changed its computation for bad debt expense from 2% to 3% because of the economic effects of COVID-19. Palmer's West Coast Division forgot to record an adjusting journal entry um, for depreciation expense made two years ago. The division discovered this error in the current year. During the current year, Palmer extended the estimated useful life of certain equipment from seven to 10 years. As a result, depreciation for the current year was materially lowered. And then the company changed from the average cost method to the FIFO method for inventory costing purposes. Indicate the nature of each transaction in your recommended reporting and a brief rationale. Okay, this, number one, was a change in estimate. So, no. Separate disclosure is required unless it was material. The second one here, West Coast Division forgot the adjusting entry. That's going to be an error. We're going to show this as a prior period adjustment. Okay. And then here, this is a change in estimate from seven years to 10 years. And we're going to uh, treat the effects just in the current period. We're going to use that estimate to calculate our current and then eventually our future periods net income. If it's material, we, um, if it's a material item, but change in an estimated useful life is considered part of normal business activity. And then finally, in change in accounting principle, is this number four here, 
average cost of FIFO. And so we're going to, uh, um, prior periods are going to be recast as if the new method was used. That's a retrospective treatment. Okay, a nice um, example of a summary of all these um, issues. Okay, we're going to compare accounting principle procedures for, for both under GAAP and IFRS. So here, both GAF and I, here's the similarities between IFRS, International Financial Reporting Standards, and our generally accepted accounting principles. They require the companies to indicate the amount of net income attributable to non-controlling interest. Both GAAP and IFRS follow the same presentation guidelines for discontinued operations, but IFRS defines a discontinued operation a little more narrowly. Both standard setters have indicated a willingness to develop a similar definition, we call that convergence, to be used in a joint project on financial statement presentations. Again, similar, both GAAP and IFRS have items that are recognized in equity as part of comprehensive income but do not affect net income. Both GAAP and IFRS allow one statement or two statement approach preparing the statement of comprehensive income. Differences. Here we have the presentation of income statement items under GAAP. It follows either a single step or multiple step, multiple step format. IFRS does not mention the single step or multiple step approach. In bullet point number two here, um, IFRS companies uh, companies must classify their expenses either nature or function. GAAP does not require that, make that requirement, but SEC requires a functional presentation. And in bullet point number three, IFRS identifies certain minimum items that should be presented on the income statement. GAAP has no minimum information requirements. However, the SEC rules have more rigorous presentation requirements. And the IFRS does not define key measures like income from operations. SEC regulations define many key measures and provide requirements and limitations on companies reporting non-GAAP IFRS information. Under IFRS, revaluing property, plant, and equipment and intangible assets is permitted with gains reported as other comprehensive income. The effect of this difference is that application of IFRS results in more transactions affecting equity, but not net income. And that ends chapter three. And when we return, we will begin chapter four. Until that time, bye for now. I want to do that.